Hey everyone, Benjamin Lupton here, founder of Beverly. So the past uh, several months, I guess, uh, we've been considering how to uh, kind of revise Beverly uh, going forward. So around uh, after we finished the Viveki series, we kind of kept it going with a few interviews and uh, uh, research paper readings, as well as some general discussions. We also covered uh, the manifestos of several domestic terrorists. So we kind of leveled it up. We feel more capable in kind of dealing with larger topics as well as we're more sure of our own axioms that we've developed reading the uh, classics that we have uh, as part of our reading group. Uh, so, however, uh, the interests have kind of gone in different areas. So a little bit of a backstory. Uh, Beverly started as uh, a open source company uh, to uh, facilitate my open source and consulting work back in 2011, because I was taking on larger clients. Uh, then in 2014, the company closed down and it became a community, uh, which was more appropriate at the time because the work went into open source rather than with consulting, it was more sponsorship and donation work. And then we did the Jordan B. Peterson community in 2016 or 2017. Uh, and in 2019, I believe we merged that into Beverly. Uh, and because Beverly has always been focused on uh, empowering everyone to do what they love and sharing it with the world, uh, which requires you to actually have axioms that respects what other people love and not interfere with it, it turns out. Right? Like you don't want an ISIS member doing what they love. Um, if it's violating what you love, like, so, I, you have to have some philosophy there. And that was a big learning uh, from the Peterson community and whatnot. And through my exploration over the years, we need uh, companies or communities and individuals to actually embrace philosophy, which is to question their axioms and go, and this is available at beverly.me. It will link to our manifesto um, that we ended up uh, writing. By me, I'm talking mostly about myself, but also with feedback from the other leadership of veteran people over the years, such as John and Samet, um, and the others we've solicited feedback um, over time. So uh, once we did Viveki, as I said, things kind of winded down and we've been trying to think how can we kind of make everything active, make it kind of inspiring to go forward. Uh, so for uh, the community, like the Discord community uh, before it was kind of a cooperative governance. Uh, we moved that into a benevolent dictator model, which is a common model in open source. So I've kind of taken over as the benevolent dictator, which I was already for Beverly, but now it's also for the Discord channel, which allows experiments to run quicker. But it take, but combining that with what we learned from cooperative governance. So there's still formal governance for things um, this little for voting, this little the cooperation in facilitating feedback and soliciting feedback and incorporating feedback, uh, conflict resolution, things like that. So it's kind of more about building trust and soliciting feedback or cooperative and cooperative feedback. Um, so that's been good. Uh, so kind of moving Beverly then to, I guess, version four was that uh, situation. And it's also been a challenge of what do we do about the YouTube channel? So we have uh, the Beverly philosophy channel or the main Beverly channel. Uh, then we have the Beverly build channel and we have the Beverly reading channel. Um, and that's somewhat loosely related to our pillars in the manifesto being philosophy, build and praxis. Uh, however, uh, it doesn't really need uh, match neatly because for instance a uh, build was meant to be about action for projects um, but what happens if we're reading research papers or discussing uh, more philosophical things related to build projects so for instance which licenses to use or you know what are the current state of decentralized software that can get very uh, philosophical um, so it's kind of been hard because no matter which way we look at it, there's always been like a intersection of where to uh, 
where should this tit for tat situation go in regards to individual membership versus the collective cooperation or in terms of well which channel should we utilize and on the discord channel on the meta uh, on the discord community on the meta channel i've been iterating through my thoughts over the past uh, several months and if you watch the recent uh, interview I did with Michael Tooman. He uh, founded a thing called Invisible College, uh, which is actually a very long, well, actually he didn't found it. He kind of, cause it is a, it's a tradition. Um, so he kind of renewed the tradition in a more digital context. Um, you can watch that talk, that interview for more details about it. Um, so, however, that's interesting because the invisible college, it kind of removes the collective and it's all about the individual. And it's kind of a collaborative front behind the scenes. So very similar to how we uh, interact in community somewhat. Uh, well, it's not really that similar to, a, to many, many existing things. Probably like our family. Our family is a good instance of that where each member in our family is a very distinct personality or persona. And then there's kind of like a culture there and we all assist each other with our own goals. Uh, and however, there isn't really any uh, thing where it's like, you have to do this to be part of our family. It's something that transcends uh, the actual members. Now that's fine uh, to an extent, but I think there's a, flaw in it in that it removes the ability for collective will to an extent. It certainly eases collaboration in a very innovative way. Um, however, when we look at governance, uh, governance has been one of the greatest technological uh, innovations humans have ever come up with, uh, which is the ability to amass individual power into collective power to enforce change, be it oppressive or empowering. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's the whole realm of politics and why politics is such a big part because it is such a force. Uh, so there is power in collective will. And we see this also not just in uh, governance in terms of governments, but we see it in governance in terms of companies, how companies are structured right now uh capitalism has kind of even been a thing now that influences governments and where companies uh now kind of resembling empires so there is a so collective will or collective unionship is actually something that is powerful we see this also with many uh podcasts where it would be uh, under a collective brand with a specific goal. So when it comes to organization, uh, there is a, there's to an external extent, the boundaries blur, but at another extent, I think I found out where the distinctions are. So we have uh, a, one of the examples here would be uh, Ferros on YouTube. Uh, he's got a meetup called Speakeasy JS. And rather than doing a YouTube brand, he's doing that on his own uh, persona, his own, uh, his own channel. Uh, now, if we were to do that with uh, Beverly, then probably everything would be on my channel. Some things would be on John, but it, what it does is it removes the uh, ability in the same way that hosting GitHub repos on your own personal account, it removes uh, the collective will aspect of it there is a clear leader uh and it's not something that uh the where if that leader dies um to some extent you're you could probably continue it on on the channel or their repo um in this probably the same type of narcissistic legacies where we name universities or parks after people um but that's more like a tribute um However, uh, what you want, if you want massive scale, is you want something where there is a co-host, where the contribution is decentralized, where eventually people can go from guests 
into participants, into members, into con like, yeah, contributors, into kind of leaders or co-hosts. Uh, and that will scale a lot further. Um, so that's kind of been the goal with Beverly, which is why ever since I've pretty much hosted all my GitHub repositories on Beverly uh, rather than on my own personal account. And that's actually affected me poorly because all the GitHub stats and rankings for sponsorship fame, um, because sponsorship is a fame game, uh, rewards people who host everything on their own personal username. They view organizations incorrectly as companies um, rather than as community or voluntary work. So everything's been on Beverly to kind of facilitate that collaboration, that multi-owner, um, and not really multi-owner, but multi-maintainer um, ecosystem. So I think at least that's the case. So, so if you do have a collective, uh, uh, you get access to multi-maintainer uh, ecology. Uh, and it becomes its own ecosystem. Whereas if things are just under your own personal brand, it is certainly empowering because there's less people you have to go through, but then there's actually more responsibility and weight and obligation and stress and anxiety on your own brand as well. And it actually becomes harder to kind of reinvent yourself to an extent because now it's yourself with this huge baggage uh, and hubris that you need to carry around if you want to experiment with things now you're pissing off people because you changed uh, and if you want to solicit feedback um, you know ultimately you're the head honcho and maybe you'll have mentors and that type of relationship and you can kind of proceed forward in that way so what we uh and that's fine like you know so for instance uh felix he's kind of set up the persona uh, PewDiePie and PewDiePie has evolved pretty much every single year. So you have a, uh, however, PewDiePie has evolved slowly and PewDiePie does not match equivalently to Felix. Uh, so you do have a situation where if you are doing your own personal brand, uh, it is healthy to detach your person from your persona so you can actually reinvigorate uh, your persona and match it to the audience um, because actually having a complete equivalency there uh, actually interferes with your ability to uh, interact with specific audiences. So for instance, uh, we can take uh, conversations. So if you were to have conversation with someone from the opposite political spectrum, it would be a lot more rewarding for you to have that uh, with them without them knowing anything about your own political affiliation. Um, whereas if you were to presuppose, or what would you call it? Um, what's the word? Poisoning the well uh, with existing uh, known presuppositions about each other, uh, then it actually uh, interferes with your ability to have a productive conversation because you're injecting uh, biases that may not uh, match up neatly with them. So, and we actually see, saw this with Beverly when we moved from two years of private meetings in our discussion group uh, under the Jordan B. Peterson community when we started doing public meetings. We would have about 20 people all across the world joining our uh, private meetings. Uh, and as soon as we went public, it reduced down to two to five um, people. And uh, the idea here is, um, and we also did the private meetings at the same time. So we did private and public at the same time and both went off. And the takeaway from that was that by doing public meetings, people could then see us in a non-interactive way where they don't have a voice and they see things they disagree with and that blows them out from contribution. Um, whereas if it was a private conversation, they can actually interject and say the piece and revise the conversation. Um, 
And that's something which, uh, you know, we've facilitated with Beverly, uh, which is, you know, if, even if I, on the channel, I've said things that I disagree with now, um, and I've said <laughs> things that, uh, you know, were just musings and explorations, um, which aren't actually positions or opinions I hold, they're just uh, musings to formulate what opinions I might decide to hold. Um, and, you know, that's a good place to be where you can explore ideas without um, fear or without uh, a one foot in one door and one foot in the other door. You can completely leap, experiment with these ideas and then decide if it fits. So what you have is then a situation with the kind of, kind of state of YouTube where should we upload like all videos I do is on my own channel. And then we say, fuck Beverly or all, all John's videos on his own channel. And then that removes this collective power uh, in Beverly. Or do we put it under Beverly and then have this tit for tat game of, you know, when shall we put a video on Beverly versus when shall we put a video on our own personal channel? So pretty much since Beverly happened, I haven't really uploaded anything on my personal channel. Uh, John's still uploaded a few things on his own channel uh, and still participated uh, on Beverly. But we have this uh, situation where, you know, we have contributors or new members join and, you know, we want to get them on board. Um, but we don't want a situation where they're kind of feeling as if they want to reserve themselves because they're just feeling like they're furthering the Beverly brand rather than their own. And so it's been like a difficult uh, situation to kind of go And All of this would be solved with the Fountain Project, which is one of Beverly's project where it's kind of like YouTube, but you can browse things by participant. Um, so people can follow me and then see all the videos uh, and appearances or even perhaps blog posts eventually, which I've participated in. Um, so it's not about channels at all, it's about people and then tags or communities and clubs or whatever around those people. So that's kind of the whole backstory. So I think I finally figured out uh, something that takes all of that and puts it into something that can work, which is also why this discussion is actually on, uh, going to be on the Beverly channel because I figured out, hey, uh, you know, this would be great to, this is part of this direction or this experiment. So let me share my screen and narrate uh, the proposal. So in the meta channel of the Beverly Discord, uh, here's my latest thinking. So we have a philosophy club co-hosted by myself and John, hopefully other members as they become contributors. The goal is exploration and experiments of collaborative wisdom. So seek, uncover, identify, question, challenge, whatnot. It is what makes sure that Beverly continues to question its own axiom and also markets and develops its current ones. Another club, the technology club led by myself, goal is exploration and experiments in meeting collaborative wisdom with technology be it decentralization, centralization, licensing, uh, free and library, open source software, whatever. We can't ignore that technology is now just as important as philosophy in our lives today. The battle of our generation will be whether digital technology is used to amass evil empires or not, which is a battle we all have a role in. Uh, for instance, the just check out China and Censored uh, pretty much for, for any details in that or the movie Social Dilemma. So uh, the third club, the reading or movie club led by everyone. Goal is readings and watching. So either with or without commentary on things that further collaborative wisdom or facilitate the goals of other clubs, as well as discussions of their read or watch materials. Four, the discussion club led by everyone. The goal is to scale and facilitate the practice of exploring collaborative wisdom. Pretty much any collaborative effort in the other clubs will be part of this club too. Five, the Praxis Club, led by supporters. The goal is to turn collaborative wisdom into action in our lives. Currently, myself and Smith have been leading this privately for several weeks as its application is personal and thus confidential. 
and six, uh, leadership and meta club. Here, updates and beverage occur. So this, for instance, would be part of the leadership club on the beverage channel. So clubs can intersect, members can intersect, contributions and interests can intersect. Clubs are merely sub-movements of the larger beverage movement or perhaps coalition. We can make and kill as many clubs and projects as we want. This means everything gets consolidated into the one beverage channel, which will get way more activity and also be more inviting and active of multifaceted multi participation while maintaining the individual agency of the members and the clubs, providing the beverage energy is directed to the beverage goals. Collectives are useful in manifesting collective action. That can't be done away with. Yet we can reinvent the collective where it respects organic associations while maintaining goal oriented leadership. Regarding platform external clubs on our channel, ideally we would incorporate the club within Beverly. However, not every book in an external reading club may be to Beverly's collaborative wisdom tier loss. However, Beverly and the intersecting members and their external club can all benefit from such platforming for the books that do align with the tier loss as cross promotion, which is a sure way to grow channels. So regarding cross posting or submissions, if the particular episode is under the tier loss of collaborative wisdom, then it is good, it's fine. If not, then it should go elsewhere and we just do a shout out or a Discord link to it. So if someone has an episode that facilitates collaborative wisdom, we'll take it and even promote their own channel for future updates and hope that they will reciprocate and shout out Beverly in the future of their own channel. So again, you can't, uh, you know, you can give people contracts and be like, hey, you know, if you get featured on our channel where, you know, you're now obligated with all these obligations to, you know, give back and everything like, you know, <laughs> but reciprocity and trust and friendship don't operate on contracts. Uh, contracts can protect, uh, uh, when those things go bad, but a contract doesn't suddenly instill uh, trust. All it does is dissuade the fear of when something goes wrong, you're up shit creek. So you still need a culture uh, and trust and discrimination of who you let into your life uh, and even guests on your podcast of whether or not um, they are actually a good person with similar goals. Um, and then you can have contracts to prevent it. So, but the goal here isn't really contract related. This is even though it's something I'm experimenting with uh, on the site. Well, actually I'll share it at the end. Um, so the goal here then is, you know, just to say, hey, you know, it's kind of more a culture of like cross promotion on things that share the same telos for things that don't. Well, again, it's just a matter of we'll promote, but we won't platform. Um, and we'll promote it in the original thing that did share uh, the similar telos. So uh, you, for instance, you could have like a reading club and then they have like five books. And one of those books is, uh, you know, there's a turns out to be a crossover with collaborative wisdom. So then we could feature that episode or replicate that episode on Beverly and just include a link to their book club um, below. So for instance, I upload a video discussing my struggle with trichotillomania, which is compulsive hair pulling on Beverly that works as it invites others into the discussion. At the end of the video, I advertise my personal channel if they want future updates. I shout out the Beverly video on my own channel and host discussions about the topic on Beverly as part of their praxis and discussion clubs within Beverly. The Beverly channel will become a hopscotch of all sorts of things. However, all unified under the collaborative wisdom telos. Oh, so hopscotch, Australian lingo, uh, probably melting pot is the American lingo. Um, so however, all unified under the collaborative wisdom telos, and I hope or rather should have faith or at least maintain conjecture that the telos of collaborative wisdom is big enough to draw and maintain an audience and community who believes in it. And this desire for multifaceted integration, which is completely missing from current typical sources. So the reason why this is going on the channel is I want, 
I know that the Discord community may not actually be our YouTube uh, community. So I want feedback from the YouTube audience, uh, which is you watching this right now, uh, on whether or not this direction uh, resonates with you. Um, and if it doesn't, please, you know, join the Discord and provide your feedback. Or if it does, you know, just thumbs up the video, or, you know, join Discord as well, hopefully, and, you know, engage in conversation with us. Uh, so, so pretty much the change of the YouTube channel here uh, is going to be uh, moving away from, uh, right now the beverage channel has mostly been philosophy focused with, you know, some interviews uh, that are more catered towards certain sub clubs or sub interests. Um, and then we have the beverage build channel, and then we have the every reading channel and we have the uh my own personal channel and we have john's own personal channel and it's always been hard to figure out which channel to do and whether or not we should create new channels and start all again with the subscriber battle um so for instance you know if i want to upload things about decentralized technology um uh then should that go on philosophy or should that go on technology what happens if we're actually discussing the philosophy of decentralization uh, should that go on philosophy or on the technology channel? So, you know, it's been hard. Like, should we rename Build to technology? Should we rename my personal channel to Berry Technology? Uh, should we do them all under the same? So the proposal here is we uh, kill Berry Build, we kill or archive Berry Build. So it's still public available, but it's not maintained. So we archive Berry Build, we archive uh, Berry Reading, we move the reading videos onto the main beverage channel. Uh, my channel continues, although my activity on that will be for things that aren't particularly beverage related, which is things that aren't specifically related to collaborative wisdom. So that could be like personal life updates rather than beverage updates. And the beverage channel then becomes a movement towards collaborative wisdom with sub clubs uh, and members and interest groups related to achieving uh, collaborative wisdom. So, uh, you know, an iteration, so to reiterate, uh, it would be philosophy club, technology club, reading or movie club, discussion club and praxis club and the leadership club. So for instance, praxis club, that would be like, you know, I, me uploading a video about my struggles with trichotillomania or kind of myself and submit uh, kind of doing a presentation on our tips and tricks for like personal productivity uh, that we've devised over the last six months in our weekly meeting calls. Um, and, you know, the reading a movie club could be if, you know, a member uh, watches a movie they want to discuss, uh, we host it on our channel. And, uh, or a book uh, they want to discuss. Uh, we hosted on Beverly again, providing it, it somehow funnels into collaborative wisdom. Um, otherwise they'll go on their own channel. Now, again, once Fountain is done, uh, it kind of achieves the goals of allowing anyone to discuss anything, uh, be it collaborative wisdom or not. Uh, that's the project that I'm trying my best to launch this year. Um, along with everything else. Pretty much everything is like, uh, you know, between 20 to 90% done. There's probably like three projects that are like 90% done and they just need to get done, <laughs> like, you know, out the door. Um, so uh, this year, a lot of things will actually launch in the project department. And I know I say that a lot, but it, it will be this year. I've, I've, everything's kind of aligned in my life to finally launch them. Um, so, yeah. And then technology club, there'll be things like reading uh, research papers around technology. So like, you know, what is a distributed hash table, uh, reading the braid network protocol, reading things to kind of uh, level people up in the technology factor. Like, because a big issue here is uh, in the modern day is concern of data privacy. And, and this is a real concern, a, a incredibly important concern. You have, uh, the Snowden revelations, you have uh, the movie Official Secrets, um, uh, which isn't that much related to it, but tangentially uh, in terms of uh, 
delegation of power to others, which is decentralization. So, you know, cryptocurrencies, like be your own bank, what is economics? Um, cryptocurrencies were influenced by, uh, you know, the economics, uh, economists uh, to try and find a currency that uh, uh, doesn't have arbitrary inflation. So, and, you know, a global ledger and things like that. So like, you know, for whatever we create, uh, philosophy wise, we embed them. So we like, we think, then we uh, build and we act. So we think about philosophy, we think about our axioms, we build them into projects, uh, which is technology, we innovate, uh, and we act in our own lives with praxis, we try and be better people. Um, so the goal here is to unite, uh, you know, all this multifaceted interest in under this collaborative wisdom umbrella to actually really have something that inspires and collects uh, people into a invigorating movement to achieve something that can actually radically uh, change, I guess, or inf yeah, change or complement the status quo. Um, and you can read about our projects at beverly.me slash projects. Um, but yeah, if we, if we just, even for John, he's working on uh, either a book or a paper or a presentation right now about ep epistemology. How do we know what we know? Um, so he's, uh, again, uh, but as Viveki talks about, it's psychotechnology. So, you know, we have technologies in the physical world, such as a chair or a vehicle. We have technologies in the digital world. We have technologies in the virtual world. Um, we have technologies in the psycho uh, world, in the mind. Um, ways to think, ways to innovate our thinking processes in our minds, ways to think differently. Um, so these are all technologies. Uh, and it's, it's naive or foolish or uh, uh, what would you call it? Uh, not crude, it's crass. Let's see, crass. Uh, well, unsophisticated. It's unsophisticated to assume or to categorize them as if they're not. Uh, so we have to think um, about, you know, why we do what we do, what we should do, uh, and amass that F, that uh, imperative into technology in all its different forms and into personal action to make sure that we're not like the ordinary men or the people at Silicon Valley who create surveillance machines and then regret it once they develop a conscience. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, it, the world would be a lot better place if people develop their conscience before they committed horrific acts. Um, and that's difficult um, because why and what we should do is difficult and you need a space that uh, allows people to question uh, what they hold sacred. Now, there is an important distinction here, uh, which is that you don't want, it's also important to realize that axioms or worldviews uh, can operate uh, successfully independently of each other. Uh, so this is like emergent uh, evolution or emergent economics. Um, so evolutionary theory uh, is fantastic on, uh, I, I can't remember the exact terminology. We, we started reading a few papers about evolutionary theory based on our initial one on um, a natural history of rape. We then uh, selected three other books on evolution. So natural history of rape talks about the individual selection uh, theories for why rape is a thing. But there's also, since that book was written in the 90s, there's also been uh, success in one, mimetic evolution, but also two, in cultural group or collective evolution. So group selection. Um, so things like suicide are explained by group selection. Um, and other, there's a whole array of things and it's fascinating. 
Uh, so we have some books, uh, you know, lined up in our reading list to cover them. It's just, you know, a matter of who wants to actually discuss it and, and when can we. Uh, so, you know, the goal is to expand pretty much everything in this movement or, you know, this imperative of collaborative wisdom out because uh, even, say, in the state of capitalism, for instance, it, there is a, a the, there is, There is, a, so, you know, to not go on a huge tandem, it could be its entire own episode, but uh, there is an inherent flaw of capitalism, which was kind of shown in Social Dilemma, but they, they, that movie I have a lot of criticism with, and I hope to discuss it in depth on another uh, episode, but one of the inherent issues is uh, a company can't shut, its shut itself down if it considers it's doing a moral wrong because it would then violate its obligations to shareholders, which is illegal. It has to continue to provide returns to shareholders um, within the legal framework. And that could even be lobbying to change the legal framework. So you have a situation where CEOs, despite originally hoping to be ethical, uh, hands are tied in a machine which uh, they cannot escape from. Um, and again, this is like another thing, like many 20 year old people, they go like, yeah, I want to work at Google, Facebook. Uh, and, you know, they seem like great rather than actually being like, no, I should work for companies that actually improve uh, the, uh, that's a little bit dismissive of my own behalf to, you know, be that dismissive. Um, I'm just trying to specifically talk about the one, uh, sliver of truth in the statement, which is that um, there is ethical concerns with the attention economy, severe ethical concerns, as well as mass data surveillance, um, where technology companies or even governments can become uh, more powerful than what individuals can do, where they can actually manipulate behavior incredibly well. Um, where they are the game inventors. And this is something which uh, Marxism uh, or social revolutions um, do get right, uh, which is that if the system, if the game that an elite class uh, has prescribed for you uh, constrains you to that game, it may be time for uh, revolution. Um, I've written a blog post article for this called Where Does Socialism Fit In um, on Medium. And uh, so, but what you want those is, is you don't always have to do a revolution. You can actually um, work on technologies or yeah, work on technologies, be them psychotechnologies or or tangible technologies that uh, prevent the necessity of revolution by reform. Um, so pretty much, uh, so that's, that's the thing. So what we want is to integrate uh, this focus um, into something that is active and actionable. So think, build, act. Um, and encompass technology in all its forms uh, and obliterate these artificial distinctions between categories because categories can intersect and people can be multifaceted and intersect in their interests as well as clubs and subcultures and movements. The world isn't just a, a linear black and white um, not even linear, it, a binary black and white system where every group fits neatly into their own box, despite marketing companies having tremendous value in boxing people in. Um, so, oh yeah, so for the worldview uh, thing, yeah, worldviews can operate independently of each other um, with their own axioms. It is foolish uh, to believe that every culture or nation or person uh, is obligated to abide by the same axioms or morals as you do. 
uh, that's just your own judgment. It's subjective. Um, and if you're going to prescribe that as a ethical um, claim, uh, you have to have a good theory behind it. But at the end of the day, it's only a theory. Um, and facts are still based in theory, right? There's a, uh, I shared this with John recently. Um, this is encompassed in the article, uh, the Munchausen trilemma, which is that any fact is dependent on another fact, um, which is circular reasoning. Um, so, but what you want is for your circular reasoning to be something that can actually make sustained predictions until there is something better. Um, but the point here is that in the same reason we don't contact uncontacted people, um, uncontacted tribes, uh, is that we have, uh, uh, colonizing nations have learned, um, or the UN, I guess, uh, has learned that, uh, Colonizing nations may be incorrect, but a modern uh, a theory about it is that it is unethical to contact uncontacted people. Um, one, obviously because of disease, but two, in terms of anthropological reasons, which is that uh, you don't want to, uh, uh, if their system is sustainable, let it be. Only when they seek you out is it time to engage. And this is Stargate SG-1, um, like in a nutshell, um, which is engage with other tribes, but depending on the level of advancement, like if they seek you out, then it's time to engage with them. If they aren't seeking you out, um, then don't. So you still go through and you have to figure out where the tribes are. And, you know, this is... Uh, I never watched Star Trek, but Star Trek to me just seems like communism and, and Stargate seems like individualism. <laughs> uh, so, where it's like Stargate is like against the, uh, the government, like fighting for the people and the multicultural tribes. And uh, at least Star Trek, I've never seen it, but from everyone I know who's a fan of Star Trek, they seem to be communists. Um, where it's like big government and uh, let's get everybody to be part of the, the Commonwealth. <laughs> so, um, I could be completely wrong, leave a comment if so, and, and I want to revise my opinion if it's wrong. So uh, yeah, so uh, this is a, a issue where um, uh, we don't want a situation where uh, even on Beverly, like under collaborative wisdom, where it's like the Marxist versus the free market people debate, 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 debate. Uh, debates, uh, unless they are discussions that are respective of divergence, um, where divergence is okay, then they're not fruitful. They're just doing it for, for uh, what do you call it? Um, narcissistic and cronyistic attention games where it's like you know i'll argue with you you argue with me and at the end of the day uh we haven't learned uh anything besides more about our individual axioms um and how evil the other person's tribes are um what you want is to find out why and how uh and when like apply science to uh politics or to axiomatic thinking which is under what environment, uh, so what, under what inputs, yeah, under what inputs, within a context, which inputs and in, produces which outputs? Uh, that's pretty much always what you wanna figure out. And how then does that context or that ecology or that economy connect to uh, divergent or inter interconnected ones? Um, and when you figure that out, then you can actually have productive bipartisan conversations because there's no obligation for you to get the other person to agree with you, other, otherwise they're evil. Um, instead, you can go at them and say, hey, you're, you know, say for instance, a liberal versus a Christian conservative. Um, so we have like a, um, I was watching something like the Jug Squad or the uh, uh, like say pro sex worker, pro porn, uh, uh, pro what a Christian conservative would consider uh, 
uh, what's the word, depravity, uh, liberal, right? Where as long as it doesn't hurt anyone uh, or really oppress anyone um, physically, uh, then it's fine. But what that does is it also ignores uh, the other forms of harm, which is repression and suppression. Um, so for instance, porn, uh, it's not oppressing anyone, you're not forcing them to watch the porn. Uh, but to some extent, it uh, the addictive quality of it uh, can move someone away from what they prescribed as virtues in their own life, which is a happy marriage or happy relationships or a conducive uh, uh, attitude towards uh, intergender or even personal uh, development, which is the whole no fap and your brain on porn uh, communities. Um, so you, you have instances where different groups are prescribing different virtues. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to find out what is the limit. You don't want the two groups just to bicker and say they're wrong. Um, what you want is for each group to find out within their context, which inputs produce which outputs under you know, which conditions. So or if output, you want to find out exactly which inputs are producing the outputs, because some of the inputs could be unknown to you. You may not be aware of them yet. You may deduce that pattern A or output A uh, is actually due to input A, but it could actually be more highly color, color, colorated? correlated correlated with uh, uh, input C, which you have not yet discovered. Um, so, you know, it's the same thing with like uh, uh, tribute. Well, to some extent, there's many reasons why people would offer sacrifices to the God. One is a development of a discipline of humility and respect for that which is greater and a uh, kind of like a law of attraction to the extent that is true. Uh, the thin sliver, which it's true um, in terms of meditation, prayer. Uh, can develop in oneself. So besides that, there's also the aspect of um, sacrifice where it's like, if we sacrifice our crop, our, if we make a sacrifice, our crops may be better. So that could be loosely correlating um, uh, input sacrifice with good crops um, because the gods are the context they've isolated. Um, so, so it's, it's ineffective. So that pattern of sacrifice to good crops may be the best pattern uh, that they've observed so far, but it may not actually be correct due to things like climate change or, uh, you know, maybe you shouldn't cut down all the trees because then you would salinate your area and all the rest of the uh, issues like say Easter Island cut down all the trees <laughs> to build the big stones and then you salinate your entire island and uh, can't grow crops anymore um, so, so uh, nothing related to well, that's actually an instance where the God belief actually harmed uh, or the sacrifice belief actually uh, really did harm uh, significantly uh, that tribe um, providing that's the theory that actually pers uh, pers perspired, perspired, perspired. Um, so, so what you want is, yeah, to find out within a context, because again, in the modern world, we've got multiple cultures, multiple nations, and all of them uh, are still operating. Um, some, you know, more wealthy than others, but wealth isn't the only determination for success. Uh, power is another one. Uh, uh, integrity or uh, resilience is another one. Um, so uh, you want, um, it, it's foolish to then prescribe your own culture or community as superior to another uh, because you're doing the judgment that is only reserved for uh, God or the rule maker of the universe. Um, because only the universe can actually know which one will actually be ultimate. Um, that's not actually up to you. Uh, and if you do believe it's up to you, it doesn't uh, really result in uh, uh, good things. Uh, well, actually, it depends. If you lose, uh, it's a very binary thing. If, if you lose like Hitler did, 
uh, very bad. If you win like Genghis Khan did, uh, very, uh, very good to, you know, in terms of an evolutionary output of the uh, winners. Um, so not in regards to, you know, what a myself would prescribe to that uh, ethically that because as I'm saying, it, it's not for me to cast that judgment. So what you want with debates is not just like, hey, let's have a Marxist versus a uh, libertarian. Um, what you want is a discussion with the Marxist to find out what is uh, uh, what experiences and stories and influences have incurred in the life to build this context and what is the inputs uh, that is prescribing the outputs that they are wanting to see. So what are the, the context and the patterns uh, that they are observing? And you know, to some extent, you can offer them then better feedback on how to achieve those patterns within their own uh, framework of the world. Or you could then say, hey, there's also another game uh, that you could be playing. Um, and these are the axioms and the patterns within it. And it's also equally valid to your one. Um, and then you can actually focus then on a discussion about when the individual games are actually most uh, effective or successful. So for instance, uh, in my blog post, uh, when socialism fits in, I talk about when in the spectrum of a civilization, so socialism is actually the best system and when Marxism or communism is the best system or when free markets are, or when anarchy is. Uh, and I go into the, the time-based uh, system of that. Um, so what you want is to figure out, uh, so th that's one of the concerns. The reason I'm talking about this is uh, it's very uh, part of the current, uh, I don't know, I, maybe it's purely an American culture where it's like, let's just get two bravados to like battle each other. And it's kind of like, oh, sports, um, not useful uh, to an extent. Now it's useful to the extent those people represent the gods or the, the, uh, the blessed individuals of this system to represent the rules uh, to then combat uh, intellectually in a mimetic uh, uh, sword fight um, to figure out which ones are victorious. But these days, uh, society is incredibly uh, complex and difficult and not understandable by any one individual <laughs> uh, ever. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, you know, that's also why Facebook and Google and governments are wanting to amass as much data as possible to make accurate predictions to influence people's behavior. Um, they just want to get as much data as possible because it is a very complex world. So the more data you have, the better it is. Um, so, uh, yeah, so what you want is uh, uh, people to get away from the sportsmanship uh, and instead do uh, a more Socratic uh, discussion, which is asked uh, why five times uh, as like the layman's interpretation of that. Why do you like Marxism? Okay, why do you like that? Okay, why do you like that? Why was that important? Why was this important? And you can keep going down. And eventually, uh, if someone is inexperienced, inexperienced with uh, 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 philosophy, uh, they will enter into panic um, as they realize their axioms aren't grounded on anything real. Um, and it will look as if they're falling and they're trying to grab onto anything. And then they'll give like axiomatic uh, justifications like, look, it's just this way. Or look, everyone knows. Or look, uh, it's just blah, blah, blah. Like anytime someone says it's just blah, 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 you're getting an axiomatic justification, uh, not actually a uh, 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 something that, uh, it, it's just a return to circular reasoning. Um, so what you want instead is something that can connect uh, uh, and interconnect 
uh, with those axioms instead. So you know, instead, it, whereas if they have done that dance a bit, what you want is, as Peterson talks about, someone who can uh, uh, be like a mimetic phoenix, which is, um, uh, it is better to kill your persona than to kill your person, which is that if, you're, if you don't revise your axioms, that may severely uh, kill, uh, harm or kill your person. You don't want that. What you want instead is to revise your um, axioms or your by killing your personas when they become faulty rather than your person. Um, so for instance, if you have faulty axioms, you may be driven to kill yourself uh, through suicide um, because your perspective of the world is so faulty that you have no place in it. Um, not good. Instead, it's better to instead kill your persona, which is to say, I have no place in this world I've constructed. I must now reform uh, or rev revolt against my existing consciousness to reform my worldview in something that is actually a game that I have the ability to play that is rewarding to me, which may not be the game that I have been previously prescribed or prescribed on myself or others. Um, so with that, you now want to uh, uh, be like a, a phoenix, which is uh, uh, with a training uh, in philosophy or just, you know, and maybe that's autodidactal. Maybe you've never studied philosophy before. Maybe you have a temperament that is disagreeable and you want to just go at people um uh, in this mimetic challenge um type way and you're used to reinventing yourself um maybe because you've had a lot of personal traumas you've been forced uh, the universe has called upon you to reinvent uh yourself several times um so if you've had that training then when you do the wire game several times and you realize oh shit i have no idea what i'm talking about i uh, said that's a rush of uh endorphins because you've realized um, a boundary. It's like climbing Everest. You've realized a point in yourself which you've now reached your uh, boundaries and it's a new frontier, a new horizon. Um, uh, like the image that Viveki uses for his Meaning Crisis series where it's the, I think it's called The Wanderer. Um, and it's a man standing on a cliff uh, and the clouds are below him looking out um, to the world. So so that's what, that is the uh, embodiment uh, that at least we're trying to achieve uh, in Beverly. And I'm not, you know, I'm speaking not even part of myself or on behalf of John or Samir, I'm speaking on behalf of this collective will of this uh, movement or this invisible entity. Um, so, that's the uh that's the goal and i hope that that is invigorating and exciting enough that you will welcome uh moving away from the channel just being philosophy into incorporating uh and integrating the wide array of challenges uh in thinking building and acting around uh collaborative wisdom uh so Thanks uh, for, for listening. Uh, I'll put uh, the links all in the description and uh, please, I welcome your feedback. Uh, the more feedback we have, uh, the more beneficial uh, everything will be. <laughs> and uh, uh, also the more you participate, it'll be a lot more rewarding uh, for you than just passively listening. Um, yeah, all right, thanks so much. See you everyone, bye.